This I conference am. will now be recorded. I'm just going to try and collapse this. Oop. Okay, you'll have to bear with me because uh, I've got a panel here that I'm not quite sure how I how I close, but I will make a start. Um, and if I have to to drop my uh, this panel around the screen to get to the content, bear with me. So um, yes, thanks for the introduction, Richard. It's really really good to be invited to come and um, tell you about our amazing environmental sustainability strategy. Uh, I joined the Technical Authority and Network Rail last October, so I'm just literally just about a year in post. Um, my background, as Richard said, is property, um, and, and therefore I'm, I am not uh, a sustainability technical expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I do have a team of, uh, of fantastic professionals working uh, with me on delivering this strategy. So as the, the header here um, implies, the strategy is a 30-year look ahead to how we're going to get to net zero um, in line with government, uh, the, the legislation that government have brought in around uh, decarbonisation and tackling climate change. Now I'm hoping that my, my screen is going to move on. There we go. Is that, can, Richard, can I just check that that's visible to you? Yeah, that's working well, thank you. Great, okay. Uh, I'm just see if I might be able to close this down without actually coming out of the meeting. No, I'm not, I'm not going to risk it. I'll probably come out of the meeting. So our vision um, in Network Rail is to serve the nation with the cleanest, greenest form of mass transport. Um, and we want to put our passengers and freight customers first um, to make those green choices, but also um, really supporting our local communities and being a good neighbour. So for those of you that know Network Rail, we now have these four hearts, uh, what we call our Network Rail story of why we exist, you know, and, and we exist to be on the side of passengers and freight users. We want to be easy to engage with and an efficient and dependable partner. Um, we want our people to feel proud to work for Network Rail and we want to be an instinctive industry leader. And and supporting this environmental sustainability strategy, we also have a social value framework. So this wasn't in place when we published the strategy, the ENS strategy, uh, but we do recognize that social value is almost the, the golden thread that runs through everything we're doing around sustainability. And I'll come on to that in a little bit more detail shortly. So the strategy is made up of four key pillars. So um, it's about a low emissions railway, really driving carbon out of everything we do to the best of our ability. Um, that doesn't mean offsetting, although there may be an element of offsetting, but really we want to try and eliminate as much carbon as possible. It means creating a railway that is resilient to weather um, and those events are becoming more and more um, severe uh, as we move forward, as we saw last year with the tragedy in Carmont. Um, it's also um, a railway that is improved for biodiversity of plants and wildlife. And then finally, a railway that um, in, embeds the, the principles of a circular economy, so minimising waste and the use of materials. And when we created the strategy, uh, we actually did so using quite a lot of um, listening and engagement um, uh, exercises with key stakeholders. And, and they told us four key things that they wanted us to focus on. They wanted us to use, uh, or the, the key messages that they gave to us was using more electric trains to reduce carbon emissions, making stations, tracks and trains more resilient to the extreme weather events, planting more trees to offset our carbon emissions and sending zero waste to landfill. So they were the four key messages that we got from our stakeholders that we then used to inform the delivery of the strategy. So the strategy, um, I'll go into each key pillar in a little bit more detail and I'm just shifting this little box around as I talk, so please excuse me. Um, 
but we'll, we'll achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2050 and, and actually north of the border in Scotland's railway that's going to be 2045 they're far more ambitious um, but also focusing on improving air quality and actually very recently just yesterday I, I was at the sustainable rail executive um, which is a group of um, senior leaders within the industry who are all focused on driving forward sustainability and Chris Heaton Harris the rail minister delivered a very clear message there that you know air quality is something that we really need to focus on so you'll it'll come as no surprise that actually this forms a part of our strategy um, in order to get us to uh, reduce our emissions we set um, scope one two and three targets under science-based targets to achieve those that that goal of net zero by 2045 in Scotland and 2050 in England and Wales um, and there are a lot of activities going on around the decarbonisation programme. We have a dedicated decarbonisation programme that is made up of 13 key work streams, and that's tackling all kinds of activities around, around reducing emissions. Um, I suppose some of the biggest ones here for us at the moment are our fleet. So our vehicle fleet is, is the largest in the transport family. We have in about about nine and a half thousand road vehicles um, and government have um, accelerated the targets so you know actually these this, this slide here is already out of date um, office of zero emission vehicles have directed that they want us to have zero emission vehicle fleet by 2027 now so that is a key challenge for us and one that we're really focusing on it's very high priority Oh, hang on. Sorry, you're saying can I can, can I collapse the control box? How do I do that? Do you know, Richard? It's only if it's in your way, Joe. There's a couple of errors that just point to each other, and you just click on that, and it'll get out of your way. We can't see it. Uh, okay, right. Um, I've done that, but I've still got quite a large box um, open. But I will, uh, as long as it's not impin impinging on anybody's viewing, then I can cope with that. I'll just move it around the screen. Um, the other activity that we're focusing on um, is uh, the trials of hydrogen and battery trains. And, and very excitingly, with COP26 around the corner, um, we're actually um, going to be trialling both types of trains at COP26 um, coming out of Glasgow Central Station. So we've been working with Porterbrook. Uh, and Viva Rail on that. And so we're really excited about that opportunity to showcase actually alternative forms of, of um, travel uh, in the train sector up at COP. Um, timetable options for carbon efficiencies uh, are going to be implemented for CP7. So that's another key area of our strategy. And then we're looking at alternative forms of energy. So looking at renewable energy and bringing that in, we're currently out to uh, out to market on a corporate, our first corporate PPA, which will, um, uh, which will give us 20% of our non-traction energy. Uh, but we are also looking now at traction uh, renewables for traction. Um, then we're looking at electrification, uh, the thorny subject of electrification, and, and we put the trans the traction decarbonisation network strategy is with DFT. Um, so we're waiting on decisions around electrification investment there. And I think it's probably worth saying that electrification won't necessarily be the right solution for for the whole network, um, but it certainly has its part to play. And I think we've made great progress in, in the value for money challenge around electrification um, since, the, uh, since the Great Western project. And finally, but by no means least, this, this issue of air quality monitoring, uh, we've got a programme underway at the moment with the RSSB, focusing on 100 locations, stations primarily, um, where we're monitoring air quality. We've just completed um, a trial up at Cricklewood with using a bit of kit called a Zephyr, which enables us to monitor air quality in real time. So air quality is quite tricky um, because it changes by the day, by the hour, depending upon the weather conditions. Um, but it is something that um, 
is really important and there have been some quite high profile um, cases recently um, not linked to the railway uh, but actually we have our part to play so um, we're focusing on improving air quality both for our staff and also for passengers and stakeholders that use the network So this slide just shows a little bit more detail about what scope one, two and three carbon emissions look like. Um, so scope one are pretty much those that are in our direct control. So they mainly relate to the fuel that we use in our vehicles. And scope two and three are both indirect, um, but, but scope two being more about, um, about our um, the, the costs that we're more in control of. Um, our operating costs. Um, scope three, however, it, are the ones that are really challenging. And on the next slide, I'll come, I'll just bring that up now because I think that really helps to, to kind of bring into perspective how big scope three is for us in terms of our emissions. Sorry, and I've got this is a, this is just kind of pulling out the the total footprint. So around about eight million tons of carbon dioxide um, in our emissions, and of course you can see there that ninety seven percent of our total footprint sits in scope three. And then on this slide, I think this is quite a useful slide because this really brings it to life in that majority of our emissions are actually sitting with our supply chain. So it's really important that we engage with our supply chain, that we get them on the journey with us. Um, and one of our key focuses is making sure that our supply chain has set their own science-based targets that get them on that kind of trajectory to getting to net zero um, as well. So this looks at, at that trajectory. So working in controlled periods, um, you'll see that are the key um, the key milestones for us in the strategy uh, are around energy reduction. So we've said that we will reduce energy use by 18% by the end of this control period. That's non-traction energy. Um, and we're doing that through the decarbonisation programme and looking at um, audits of our estate to identify where we can make efficiencies uh, and be more energy efficient. And then reducing our carbon emissions by 25% by the end of this control period. So it is a key challenge for us, um, but setting those science-based targets is really the way that we're tracking progress. We've set that, that, um, that clear baseline and then we can measure ourselves as we move forward. Uh, and I would just say as well that I think we were the first railway in the world to set those science-based targets at the, at the more stringent um, level um, of, of tackling climate change, one and a half degrees C. So this slide just looks at, um, I'm trying to keep it relevant to you guys, um, but looks at kind of the whole life carbon um, challenge, focusing on track, a track replacement project. So we look here at different types of carbon and carbon, in, uh, carbon comes about in, at all stages of a, of, a, of, of a project. So there's embodied carbon, um, when we're extracting raw materials, transporting those materials and manufacturing products. Then there's capital carbon supply and installation of those products. Then there's the operational carbon. And then if we come to the very final part here, the capital carbon involved in removal and disposal of those products. Sorry, I'm just jigging around with this. OK, so if we look at a six kilometre project as an example, we're looking at about 2000 tonnes in the embodied carbon. And then for capital operational carbon, we're looking at another 2000 tonnes, which therefore gives you a total of 4000 tonnes of CO2. And then if you look at that scalability, think about the number of tracks kilometres of track that we've got, that is quite a significant amount of carbon that we have going on within that kind of track renewal um, arena. 
So I'll come on now to um, the second pillar of our strategy, which is around climate change. Um, and what we said is that we want a railway that's reliable and resilient to climate change and that we're preparing that infrastructure to minimise the impacts of climate change by 2050. So we've done this in a way that um, we're looking at vulnerability uh, and prioritisation of investment. And this is it's really quite a tricky thing to do because it's a little bit of crystal ball gazing. But we all know what's happening with the weather um, and it is becoming more and more extreme. So we've got some research and development underway that's helping us with that activity, uh, with the mapping and real cost of weather and climate change um, by 2024. Um, we've created route and weather and climate change adaptation, route and asset weather and climate change adaptation plans, and they're with the Office of Rail and Road. So you know we're we're holding ourselves to account, but actually that sits with the regulator as well. So we are being monitored very closely on how we are tackling this. We've made sure that all of our policies and standards are being updated. Um, and that won't happen overnight, but we're going through that process now um, to make sure that they are updated to include climate change so that when we are working on the estate, on the infrastructure, we've got that in mind. And it's not an add on, it's actually designed into what we're doing going forward. And then with the view to having long term regional adaptation pathway strategy and investment plans by 2029. And I thought this was quite an interesting one because I think we're all very focused on COVID and the financial impact of COVID uh, as we come out of the pandemic, but actually that's nothing in comparison to ultimately what could happen if, if we have biodiversity collapse, everything really lives off nature. So this really just brings that to life. Um, you know, climate change is, is significant, um, but fundamentally, biodiversity collapse is 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 the biggest thing here. And, and if we if we have no nature, then we have no planet. Oops, sorry. So this just brings me neatly onto the biodiversity pillar of our strategy. Um, we've set two main targets here. So we're targeting no net loss of biodiversity by 2024. And by 2035, we'll be in a position where we've got biodiversity net gain. So this is really about making sure that we're giving our people the right tools to, to do what they need to do to make sure that our estate is a habitat that, um, that enhances the life of, of plants and wildlife living within it. A few years ago, we, uh, were, we were subject to a review undertaken by John Varley. Uh, he was brought in, I think, at the time by Joe Johnston, Joe Johnson, who was the then rail minister, to um, to really look at how we manage our our, our line side. Um, and the outcome of John Varley's review was that we don't manage our we didn't manage our line side as an asset, and we should do. So from that, we published a biodiversity action plan and we published biodiversity standard to support our people in understanding what good looks like and making sure that we've got consistency across the business. So we've recently published a design guide, which also supports that work. Um, and we're focusing on, um, on how we monitor that going forward using some really really quite good satellite imagery that we've got from the UK Centre from Ecology for Ecology and Hydrology. So that enables us to map via satellite um, what our habitat looks like across the whole estate and one kilometre either side of the running line. Because the other key point here is that this isn't just about a rail corridor. Actually, there are opportunities, connectivity opportunities with line side neighbours for us to really enhance those corridors of, of biodiversity. And I should also say as well, it's not just about planting trees, um, but actually, you know, there's so much more than just trees to improve biodiversity of, on our network. 
And then the final pillar of the strategy is what we call the circular economy. And this is all about reusing, repurposing and redeploying surplus resources, minimizing extraction of virgin materials from the planet. So really thinking about all of the materials we use, thinking about them from a whole life cycle perspective. Katie Beardsworth is leading on this pillar of the strategy for us. Um, and so there's a lot of research and development work now underway, looking at mapping and prioritizing various waste streams. So that's now in, in, in process, um, but we're looking to reduce waste and send zero waste to landfill by 2024 and adopting those circular economy principles by 2024. Key to this, um, as I said earlier, is engaging with supply chain because this isn't something we can do on our own. Uh, we need supply chain to be with us, uh, working hand in hand and, and focusing on those, those areas where we, we need to make improvements. And, and we'll look to reuse, recycle or redeploy all of the materials that we use by 2029. We've recently signed up to um, something called the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which is a really useful collaborative network that, uh, of organisations that we can actually, you know, where somebody's doing something really well, we can use that and, and bring it into the rail sector. And, and, and conversely, if something's not working well, then we can find out by, by working collaboratively with, you know, external organisations that are on this journey as well. Uh, this is a little bit wordy and I won't linger on it too long, but this is our social value framework. So social value, I think, is a really important part of what we're doing here. Um, as I say, it's not a key pillar of our strategy, but it, it's essentially a bit of like a golden thread that runs through everything that we do. And the aim here was that we align with the government social value model. So our four key areas are economic prosperity. So working with supply chain and partners to develop skills, education, attainment, and the resilience and capacity of our supply chain. Equal opportunity. So making sure that we're in an inclusive round network and we promote workforce diversity and inclusion well-being so thinking about you know supply chain and partners and promoting community integrate integration and enhancing people's physical and mental well-being and then finally um it's very topical but covid19 recovery is also a key element of what we're doing here so making sure that we're helping get passengers back onto the network and helping communities recover uh, from the impact of covid19 uh liz Holford um, in my team is leading on this particular um, piece of work and um, we are in November we'll be uh, we'll be launching something called the social value tool um, which really helps us monetize the social value um, activities that we're doing so things like tree planting has a social value attached to it the work that we're doing with shelter on on the homeless um, the homeless projects up in Birmingham and Manchester, again they have a social value attached to them, and I think sometimes we find it difficult with social value to really think about the the true monetized value that it adds, um, but actually it really does, and I think the rail network has a really key role to play as we come out of the pandemic in in helping the communities that we serve and connecting people. Um, so this final, I think this is the final slide um, before I finish, um, is about our key enablers. So when we when we published the strategy, uh, we actually identified six key enablers that would really help the foundation of, of making this a successful strategy. So people, I think, is actually the key one, making sure that our, under, our, our employees understand what we're doing and why we're doing it and the part that they can play in that. Um, having really clear engagement, not just internally within Network Rail, but externally. And I think one of our challenges is not to be inward looking, um, but actually to engage with, with our rail stakeholders, but also beyond and the role that rail has to play in, in sustainability. 
And then funding and planning, well, you know, we're all in, in quite difficult times at the moment as we come out of this pandemic, but really making sure that we've got robust business cases to back up the investment that we're making in, in, this, in this area. Um, technology is going to be key, so making sure that we can um, harness any innovation and accelerate delivery of, of all of the key elements of the strategy. Um, and then I suppose the bottom two, systems and processes and measurement kind of go hand in hand. So we're currently reviewing a suite of KPIs to support us with delivery of the strategy. Um, at the moment, we have numerous KPIs and I think our aim is to make sure that we, we simplify that. Um, we make it easy for people to understand what it is that we're trying to do and how they can play their part and how we're measuring our, our progress. And I think that is it. So I'm not quite sure. Richard, what would you like me to do? Would you like me to stop sharing my screen? Uh, you can do, yeah. Yeah. Or you can just leave that there as a as a nice yeah. picture showing, showing the uh, best points of our infrastructure possibly. So that's that's, that's lovely. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so just just to, that was really, really good, really interesting. Thank you for that, Joe. Um, a reminder to everyone that um, you can add any questions that you wish to ask into the chat box, which is up on the right hand side, top right hand side of the screen. Um, and that's the little speech bubble. If you click in there and then you can type a message and I, I can ask any questions that anyone's had. Um, to, get, to get things started, um, I, I, I think a thought that I had kind of running through that and, and perhaps links in with some of the themes that uh, you spoke about there, Joe. It, it, it kind of occurs to me that, you know, things have really changed during COVID and the way the infrastructure is potentially being used. Um, I wondered if, the, if there was any work ongoing um, to see if there's any potential to use the infrastructure perhaps differently. Um, if, if there is a reduction in kind of commuter traffic and that thing in the longer term, um, if, if there was any work like that ongoing? Well, I think this is interesting because I was at Euston Station yesterday with Joe Hendry, who's the station manager down there. Um, and actually, we're looking at um, most definitely thinking about freight opportunity, um, especially express freight. So, you know, this idea of um, what we have is a fantastic set of quite, you know, managed stations that sit in right in the heart of our cities. Um, and most of our stations in, in major towns are, are generally in that area, in, in the heart of those towns and cities. So, if we can get, you know, goods off, off vans and off lorries and onto rail, there's a really fantastic modal shift opportunity here. Um, but actually, I have to say, I think, I mean, I know passenger numbers are not back to where they were pre-pandemic. And we, in reality, we probably won't see that kind of number again, because actually, the pandemic has, has shown us that we can work in a different, you know, people are working differently. They want a better mix of, you know, in the workplace and, and working from home. So we may not get the same level of com commuter passengers back, but actually there's a great opportunity. I think that is coming back. And certainly I travel in on the West Coast Main Line. It's standing room only on the times that I've been on my journey into, into Euston recently. Um, but I think there's a great opportunity for leisure and we've certainly seen, you know, numbers of passengers at weekends um, and, and during the holidays, they're getting back onto rail. I think it's really, I don't know if you've seen the, the latest campaign that we've launched as an industry, We Mean Green. I think it met with mixed reviews from the chap that um, that originally created the design of the crow's foot, the British Rail crow's foot. But, the idea with that campaign is to really help people understand that they can make a difference by taking the train. Train The, the rail network is, is a green mode of transport. Um, it's not the only green mode of transport, um, but actually if you're taking a journey and you would ordinarily get in your car, if you can take the train, think about it. And that's the message that, that we're landing with that We Mean Green campaign. Yeah, I had seen that. It was quite, was quite good. I, I, I was quite pleased to see it. And I, I do take your point that certainly I've travelled into the office this week um, 
and I, I hadn't done so for a little while before that. Um, and, and the trains certainly are picking up. It, it is getting busier. So yeah, I guess it's trying to do everything we want might, might become the challenge um, in the longer term there. Uh, but yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so so just, just looking at a couple of questions that are starting to come through on the chat. So the first one's from Tony, um, and, and he's asking, given the huge amount of CO2 emissions that come from the supply chain, how are network rail engaging with the supply chain partners to, re to set reduction targets? Um, and is this likely to be backed up by penalties or incentives uh, to really move it up the agenda? Yeah, absolutely. So we're doing a lot of work with supply chain. Um, Clive, Clive Barrington, who heads up our supply chain in Network Rail, uh, and Roger Maybury, who is our Director of Supplier Management, um, have hosted and we've joined them and supported them um, a number of uh, roundtable events with key supply chain partners and also some more um, general webinars um, to really help supply chain understand that we mean business here. Um, we've set that target of having supply chain by emissions having set their own standards, their own uh, science based targets. Um, in answer to the question about um, I think probably, you know, will there be impacts on them if they don't? Well, um, at this point in time, the score, we, we do have scoring around sustainability. We can look to make sure that that is increased. So um, when we're looking at tenders, that, that actually sustainability is a key part of that. It is already, but we really need to, I think, increase that so that we focus our supply chain on the importance of this. Um, and ultimately, you know, it, it, I think it's like anything, if people don't get on the journey, then they will lose out. Um, so there are key supply chain partners who are already, I would say they're probably ahead of us um, in, in on their journey. Um, I think the challenge for us will be probably the SME type operators, not our tier, necessarily our tier one supply chain, but lower down the supply chain and really helping support them. So we've done some great work, I think already around education, giving a clear message that we're expecting them to be on this journey with us. Um, and actually, yes, you know, the reality is if they're not, then um, it will become difficult to operate going forward because everybody is turning um, greener and, um, and adopting um, better sustainability principles in their operations. Okay. Thank you. That's, that's excellent. Um, and the next question from, from David, uh, how do you ensure that planting trees line side does not lead to future problems such as traction and braking? extra work in maintenance and difficulties with the adjacent landowners? Yeah, it's a really good question. And actually it's something that Neil Strong, who works for me, he's our biodiversity strategy lead, has worked really hard on in terms of design guides. So you're right, we can't plant trees right next to the railway, you know, but trees do have a part to play and they actually have a part to play in earthworks and, and stabilization as well. So if they're planted, properly and they're looked after and we manage the um we manage our line side appropriately then they can actually really add value to the structure and stability of, of the network um so you know you look at um i suppose you look at i looked at photograph actually that john varley showed us um not so long ago of the railway in i think probably the 50s or the 60s where it was literally there was no vegetation um and actually i think what used to happen in those days was we pretty much did we burnt it you know so it was the there was no vegetation and over time things have planted and and taken seed and and so we see now this fabulous green corridor but actually so looking at that corridor having that running line you know if you if you strip that you can't have anything within that safe space actually you know as you move away from that running line there's plenty of opportunity to have appropriate um vegetation in place um and so I, what i didn't say earlier in my presentation but what is really important is we've got some fantastic pilots going on at the moment um with um southern uh, region and in wales and western as well 
that are looking at different biodiversity opportunities, um, really trialling um, different habitat types um, to see what impact that has on, on biodiversity and, and habitat creation and improving the habitat. Uh, and when we're, and of course, you know, this nature is not like a kind of, sometimes I think it's a bit, it's a bit tricky because people expect to see instant reactions. It's not like garden makeover, you know, these things take time. So we have to give nature time to, to adapt. Uh, but we have, as I say, got these really good design guides now in place. We've got the expert guidance of John Varley, of um, the Tree Council, who we work really clear, closely with. In fact, we're just about to embark on the second year of a community tree planting programme with the Tree Council, which isn't necessarily all on our network. It may be in the communities that we're serving. Um, but it's really promoting um, biodiversity and the benefit of trees from a carbon sequestration perspective. Okay, thank you very much. I'll, I know just from something I've seen actually this week come out and, and potentially a topic for a later talk from, from somebody within Network Rail, but they're, they're actually running with, with the Yellow Fleet now, a kind of digital line side mapping um, to see if there is any vegetation encroaching on the area where we don't want it so that we can focus there and actually let the further up up the embankments or away from the rail edge to grow a bit more, spend our time where it's best best use. So and, and that's all from um from HD video and, and machine learning. So that looks quite powerful um, and perhaps something we can use as well. Yeah, that's I think that's coming back to that point about tools and systems, the one benefit of using that kind of technology is that it really helps as well you know limit the amount of time our people have to be walking tracks so you know we can use that technology um, to to really help drive um, identify any challenges and keep an eye on the network so that and the satellite imagery I think are really key to helping us manage the manage the line side and of course you know we, we've got ash dieback to consider that is a a big risk going forward um, so you know using that technology to help support where we need to tackle um, specific areas is really key yeah yeah absolutely um, okay um, that's been really good and, and really useful useful Joe so th thank you very much for that um, and actually, have we got? Time? Have you have you still got time? Just seen one more. Yeah, question. no, that's, that's fine. Then, I'm take that one, and then, uh, and then we'll, we'll I'll, I'll wrap up then. So, okay. So, a uh, question from Tony: um, Is it anticipated that once HS2 takes a lot of the high-speed commuter trains, that we will see more, more local passenger services and greater opportunities to, uh, for freight operators to get vehicles off the roads and onto the rail network? Well, yeah, I think, you know, I, I don't know. I know HS2 is quite a, a thorny topic for some, but I do think there's an opportunity there. Um, West Coast Main Line, you know, it was completely at capacity pretty much. So anything that's going to alleviate the, the pressure of traffic on there will help then free up um, free up space for more freight. So yeah, I, I'm not in that area. That's not my area of expertise, but logic says that that should present an opportunity. Um, okay. So yeah. So as as I say, thank thank you thank you ever so much for that. Um, it's been really useful. I, th I think it's it's topical uh, uh, and particularly you know in the media at the moment. So it, it's nice to see. You know that we have got a plan for these things and, and, and network rail has got a strategy of what, what we're going to do into the into the longer term future so thank you very much for that um just one final little bit of section business from me um so obviously emails will be in in your inboxes fairly shortly but the next meeting of the birmingham section is at 12 30 on the 28th of october um and that will be Marek Pitcher from um, Birmingham University and he'll be talking to us about the design and build of asphalt concrete trap bed layer um, and again with, with a kind of environmental sl slant on that that they're, they're looking to use kind of 70% um, reclaimed asphalt within that so um, yeah 
interesting talk and I hope as, as many of you can join us for that but thank you very much and thank you Joe and I'll see you all soon thanks everyone bye